Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's mini PEP. I'm Leslie Lake, uh, and welcome to the National Blood Clot Alliance, uh, mini PEP patients, educating patients. Today's discussion is on lupus anticoagulant and the testing required for diagnosis. I am joined uh, today by my co-host on the PEPs, uh, Todd Robertson, who is, as you know, a board member and patient liaison at NBCA, and Shanta LeBrice from Diagnostica Stago. Uh, LaShanta is a scientific engagement and clinical educator at Stago. Uh, and today's event is sponsored uh, by an educational grant from Stago. So we'd like to thank for Shanta you for joining us today. And secondly, Stago for the educational grant so that we can really educate people about lupus anticoagulant and the testing that's required for this diagnosis. Um, so before we get started, uh, I thought maybe Lashanta, you could actually describe what your position is. Uh, you're technically listed as a scientific engagement and clinical educator at Stigo. So what does that mean? So um, it actually kind of covers two different jobs. So uh, scientific engagement, um, that part of my job entails speaking to both laboratory professionals and other clinicians. So I would be your middle person between the clinical laboratory, um, our individuals that are performing the testing, and then the link to the clinicians that are going to be receiving the test results to deliver to the patients. Part of that engagement also includes um, recruiting those that would be considered key opinion leaders over different areas of thrombosis. Um, so that's a, a fun and exciting part of my job, getting to travel across uh, the United States and sometimes over to Europe um, to meet different key opinion leaders. The clinical education um, part um, actually kind of also splits into two things. Um, so I am a laboratory scientist myself. So my career started in the laboratory performing some of the tests that we'll be talking about today. And because of that uh, skill set and knowledge that I've gained um, over the last 15 years, I oftentimes take that knowledge to different laboratory conferences and do uh, presentations covering different um, aspects of thrombosis. The second part of that clinical education arm is to help clinicians understand the testing that they're going to be receiving and some of the pre-analytical um, parts of that testing, i.e. the parts that happen before the test actually arrives to the laboratory and what they can do to try to combat some of those issues. Interesting. Well, thanks for that. We were uh, curious to know exactly what that meant. So it sounds like you've got multiple hats that you're wearing uh, at Stago. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get started. We have many questions here from the patient community uh, that we want to address. So I guess the first thing up is, uh, Lashanta, can you explain to us uh, what anticoagulation lupus is? And also, does it go by any other names? Yes, so lupus anticoagulants are known as an autoantibody that's produced by the patient's immune system that attacks certain components of their own body cells. So almost all of your cells in your body have what we call phospholipids, and those are kind of the squishy parts, if you could think of something that you could like, you know, kind of touch of your cells. And the lupus anticoagulant creates an antibody or a fighter against that little squishy area of your cells. So that's a big um, issue for the body because almost all of your cells in your body have phospholipids. So now there's just a bunch of little fighters that are walking around and kind of creating havoc in the body. It's not completely understood why patients develop these, um, but scientifically there's been lots and lots of work done by various institutions to, to try to discover why certain patients develop lupus And is it, um... Uh, I know there's a lot of talk that it's related to autoimmune disease, so there's still work going on in that space as well. Yes, so that's why it has a couple of other names that patients may hear. Um, so some people may hear lupus anticoagulant disorder. Some people may hear the term dilute Russell venom viper or DRVV uh, associated with lupus anticoagulant as well as lupus anticoagulant inhibitor. Um, all of those point to the same um, lupus anticoagulant actual antibody. Um, the thing that they may also hear, but I don't want patients to automatically associate it with is APS, and that is antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, lupus anticoagulant, it's kind of like a Dr. Seuss riddle, right? So just because you have lupus anticoagulant does not necessarily mean you have antiphospholipid syndrome. And the converse is true. If you have antiphospholipid syndrome, does not necessarily mean you have lupus anticoagulant. Yeah. It also doesn't necessarily mean you have lupus. Yes. 
So that's the other misnomer that happens in the patient community and actually in the clinician and the laboratory mm -hmm. community. And I, I work very, very hard um, in presentations to say the very long term of lupus anticoagulant and do not shorten it to lupus for that very reason. Um, the reason why it's associated with lupus is because when it was first discovered, it was seen in a systemic lupus patient. Um, but the actual lupus anticoagulant itself is not considered a diagnostic criteria for systemic lupus uh, patient. Great, thank you. Todd? Yeah, Lashantas, th thank you so much for being here. So who should be tested for this and what are the current guidelines? Um, what should patients know? So your patients are gonna be referred, of course, by a, a physician, right? So we want patients to you know, be very honest um, when they are seeing their physicians and telling them um, what's been going on. So one reason why a patient may be tested is in their original blood work, if they have something called a prolonged partial prothrombin time, um, without, you know, being on an anticoagulant, their clinician may start a workup for lupus anticoagulant. Another reason why for women um, is if they have recurrent miscarriages. Now, there is certain criteria that has to be met for those miscarriages, but that can be discussed with their OBGO, uh, sorry, OBGYN um, to see if they meet the criteria to be sent for lupus anticoagulant testing based off of miscarriages. Also, um, if a patient has a clot, um, a thrombosis, either an arterial or a venous um, thrombosis, they may be referred for lupus anticoagulant testing. This is all going to be very dependent on how um, the clinical history looks to the physician. Um, as well as meeting some criteria that's known as the Sephora criteria that would lean a physician towards suspecting a patient to be either evaluated for lupus anticoagulant or subsequently evaluated for antiphospholipid syndrome. Great, thank you. Leslie? Sure, so one of the um, questions we get all the time from patients are, uh, what type of doctor should I be seeing? So in this case in particular, what type of doctor should they be seeing um, for testing, and also what type of sample is actually required for lupus anticoagulant evaluation? So um, the healthcare system in the United States kind of operates differently depending on what type of um, health network you, health network you uh, belong to as well as what type of insurance. So typically um, the very first person that a patient sees is usually a general practitioner or a primary care physician. Um, that person um, most likely will refer that individual to a hematologist. Now for patients, they may hear the word oncologist um, and an oncologist is simply also a hematologist as well. Their full name is hematologist, hematology oncologist. Um, and that's because they, they like me wear two different hats. They cover um, hematology disorders. So clotting disorders would fall under hematology. And they also handle uh, oncology patients, which would be cancer patients. I don't want uh, mm -hmm. patients to be scared when they hear oncologist, uh, because that oncologist is certainly familiar with handling hematology-based uh, issues. Um, once they uh, see their hematology oncologist, they're going to end up um, evaluating some of their blood work and deciding on the next couple of steps going forward. Now, the the actual sample that's collected most likely actually won't be collected by um, your physician. Um, usually there'll be either a phlebotomist um, or another healthcare staff that collects your sample. And what you'll be looking at um, during your phlebotomy session is you'll be looking at tubes and they'll look like colors to you. Mm -hmm. The scientist part of it is that it's actually called a sodium citrate tube. And that is a anticoagulant that prevents your blood from clotting so that it can be tested. Um, from your per, your perspective and from a human perspective, it'll look like a blue top. And actually, I was trying to be scientifically sound, and I actually wore the color that your tube should be, which <laughs> is this light blue color. That's great. Um, thank you for that. And yeah, you raise uh, some really good points. You know, as a patient, I heard hematologist, oncologist when my blood was initial when I first met with the hematologist, and I panicked. So a really great point that they wear different hats um, and the patient should understand that it doesn't necessarily mean that they have um, cancer per se. And the other thing is 
the patient gets tested a lot of the you have a lot of little vials along the way as the blood gets tested so don't be alarmed about that uh, about that either um and thank you for wearing the blue <laughs> todd yeah that's a really good point leslie um so and we may recap on a couple of things um j just for some clarification so is there a single test uh, that can detect lupus anticoagulant. But how accurate is that test, more importantly, and what might actually affect the test results? Um, so why is the sample collection critical for the lupus anticoagulant? So there, that's a loaded set of questions. <laughs> yeah, so um, accuracy it, for the laboratory test, and this is for any laboratory test, um, is really not solely dependent upon on the vial of blood that you see. There are several factors that can improve the accuracy of testing. So one of those factors is having a really good understanding of when testing should be ordered and the clinical history. So for things that can affect the test, if you are a patient that's already on an anticoagulant, so something like heparin, argatroban, lovinox, um, coumadin, those are going to be things that impact your test. However, when the laboratory receives your tube, there's no indication on the tube because the tube is very small. So you can't put literally every single piece of information that you could ever find for a patient onto the tube. So it's really incumbent upon whoever's ordering the test that they notify the laboratory of the patient's anticoagulation status. Um, ideally uh, for the laboratory, so I, as a scientific engagement and clinical education um, person, have to wear both lanes hats, right? So for the laboratory side, I know scientifically that these anticoagulants impact testing and that, that, is, that is not an ideal time to test. However, I also know from being in residency that it's not always feasible to stop anticoagulation in lieu of testing. Um, so what can the laboratory do? they can open their, their channels of communication to ensure that they know that the um, patient is either on or off of anticoagulation at the time of testing um, and actually re release the results with more information regarding the interpretation of the results in the case that there is anticoagulation present. There are ways that the laboratory can um, prevent or eliminate some of the anticoagulation um, interference, but that's also helpful for the clinician to know as well. Um, the clinician and the laboratory are going to have to kind of hold hands during this testing process to ensure uh, the accuracy of the results. The test itself is actually ran on an automated analyzer. So this is not a, what you would see in the, in the little kid's science kit where you're just putting things together and then hoping for results to happen. Um, that's not what happens. The, the sample is um, centrifuged, plasma is removed, and then it's placed onto an automated system. And the automated instrument does all of the work as, a, as opposed to like, you know, pipetting and putting things together yourself. Um, now, other things that the pre-analytical, the part before it really reaches a lab, um, things that the collection staff can do, they can make sure that the tube is filled appropriately. There is actual guidance on how full the tube should be. In addition, um, as I stated earlier, there's sodium citrate in the tube to prevent it from clotting. Um, if a sample arrives to a laboratory that's clotted, the sample cannot be used, so that has to be recollected. So there's several pre-analytical things that we can do to improve the accuracy, as well as some pre-analytical clinician and laboratory um, things that we can do to improve accuracy as well. Awesome answers. So yeah, those are some good questions and those are some great answers. So thank you, Leslie. Yeah, that was that was really interesting. Awesome. Um, okay, so you know, if it's suspected that a patient has an excessive clotting disorder disorder, um, what tests other than lupus anticoagulant might my doctor use to evaluate or a patient's doctor use to evaluate the condition? So sometimes you're going to hear a lot of like these big words that um, represent sometimes uh, disease states, and sometimes they represent names of tests. So if your um, clinician suspects that you have a clotting disorder, you may hear large words like thrombosis or thrombophilia testing. Thrombophilia testing um, is simply to test for an excessive clotting disorder. To break down the word, thrombo means clot, and philia, if you think of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, 
philia is associated with love of as a more simple term, um, but it actually means in excess of something. Um, so for thrombophilia testing, you may get testing for protein C, protein S, antithrombin, um, which all use the same type of tube. They all should be um, light blue tubes. You may also receive uh, other testing like uh, factor V Leiden and um, prothrombin 2 complex. I'm not going to say the actual genetic name because that's just going to be more <laughs> confusing for people, but just look for the term prothrombin 2 complex. Those tubes are actually um, part of a thrombophilia workup. However, they're performed in a different section of the laboratory and actually have a different sample type. Um, so for those two, they can use a purple top. Um, a purple top is an EDTA tube, the same tube that you would see for a complete blood cell count. Um, in addition, you may see some other tests that get ordered for antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, such as anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 and anti-cardiolipin. Those, again, are um, sometimes linked with lupus anticoagulant, but they, again, go to a different section of the lab that's different from factor V Leiden and prothrombin 2 complex. They actually go to an immunology section of the laboratory, typically. Um, and those tubes can have different colors as well. So uh, when you're being evaluated, um, you may see a rainbow of tubes that you may get collected, but just note that they are being collected in different tubes because they go into different areas under different test methodologies to evaluate for thrombosis. Great, thank you. That's so, so interesting actually, the whole process by which uh, patients get tested and the, and the color coordination of those tubes. Yeah, I don't think people realize just how much yeah. goes into that. There's, exactly. there's a lot going on behind the scenes to figure out what's going on. What about, so what happens if somebody tests positive for syphilis? Why are they being evaluated for the lupus? So Why is that happening? syphilis testing actually um, uses anticardiolipins as a basis of its methodology. So sometimes a patient comes in and they get a syphilis workup as a part of a STD or SBI uh, panel and then they pop up positive. However, the clinician suspects due to what the patient has said in their clinical history that they actually probably may not have syphilis. Um, however, because anticardiolipins are part of the test panel for syphilis, they may be referred for APS testing for anticardiolipin evaluation. Um, so that is a different section of the laboratory as well. Um, so to help distinguish between a syphilis positive uh, versus antiphospholipid syndrome outright, they will refer the sample over to the anticardiolipin area, typically where APS testing is occurring to help distinguish between the two so that you're not getting what sometimes patients will hear as a false positive. Um, a false positive is a result that's positive, but it's not positive because the disease state is actually present. So in the case of the syphilis patient, you're, you're pre presenting as syphilis positive. You don't have any clinical symptoms of, of syphilis, and you also don't have a history that points to a syphilis um, diagnosis. So in this case, they're using another test to see if that test is positive, and that is actually why you're getting the false positive in the syphilis testing area. We actually get that question quite a bit in the support group, so it's nice to have that answer. Thank you. This is, this is so interesting. So my last question is, can we get you to come back and do another uh, PEP with us? Because you're just an incredible wealth of information. So thank you. Uh, we, yes, hope we, get you we hope we can get you back on to uh, keep this conversation uh, going. I know there's going to be more questions that come out of this once we, once we publish. Um, but in the interim, we just wanted to thank you today for joining us. Um, it was, I learned so much, uh, which is great. So we know that our patient community will join, uh, join us in learning so much as well. Um, and we want to thank you and Stocko for the educational grant today. Um, so thanks for joining us.